Hey everybody, it's Que Golazo time. This is our Wednesday preview. Some really good games. Carabao Cup, Manchester Derby as United face City. We go to Spain as Bilbao face Barcelona and Mauricio Pochettino's first game with PSG as Ligue 1 returns to action. We also have a real tasty matchup in Italy as AC Milan face Juventus. We have Jimmy Conrad and Jonathan Johnson joining us. So stay tuned because Que Golazo begins right now. Hey everybody, welcome to Get Go Lasso Wednesday preview. Jimmy Conrad, how are you, buddy? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, as always. You look good. Your haircut looks good. Thank you. Thank you. What, what's it say at the back there, uh, Jimmy, in the back of your board? Oh, it says Luis and JJ are my spirit animals. Well, that is so <laughs> true knocking, true knocking. And uh, from one spirit animal to the other one, Jonathan Johnson, JJ, how are you, bud? Hey there, guys. Happy New Year. Great to be back on. Very well. Very well, indeed. A lot to talk about today for Wednesday Preview because you would think, right, uh, just a Wednesday, uh, there's some cup action, not much going on. But actually, there is. And we begin in the Carabao Cup, the beautifully named, uh, he says sarcastically, Carabao Cup, as Manchester United face Man City, the Manchester Derby. And, you know, just from a purely entertaining perspective, a really good game. Jimmy, pretty good game here as the Manchester Derby features in the Carabao Cup. Yeah, I feel like they should rename it to the don't really care about it unless we win cup, because I think that makes a lot more sense. This seems to be a competition like a lot of these extra cups that exist in, in leagues around the world. You don't really pay attention to it unless you get to the semifinals. Like, all right, maybe I'll roll out my first team. And I think they will this weekend, even though they have FA Cup matches this week. Both Manchester City and Manchester United have championship sides that they're facing off against. But I'll go to William Hill right now and give you guys the odds on this. Uh, for Manchester United to win straight up, it's plus 260. The draw is plus 260 after 90 minutes, so it still can go to extra time. But after 90 minutes, if it's still uh, even, it's plus 260. And then Man City winning straight up is uh, plus 101. Good value, really, for any anything that you're feeling, uh, any result that you're feeling in particular – what I find interesting is the rematch. This is a rematch of last year's Carabao Cup semifinal. It was over two legs. Uh, City ended up going through three to two. Uh, and, and, but that's, you know, this is a one-legged affair. This time around, these two teams played against each other at Old Trafford about a couple of weeks ago. And I want all 90 of those minutes of my life back. It was the worst 0 zero I had seen in some time. So I'm hoping for some goals in this one at the very least. I do have some fun facts for you guys. So remarkably... Uh, Manchester City have only lost two of their 23 League Cup matches under Pep Guardiola, but both losses have come at the hands of Manchester United. And remarkably, times two, they have failed to score in their last four away to the Red Devils. They're playing at Old Trafford in this one. Uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is also, uh, he's won three of his six managerial meetings against Pep Guardiola. That's the Spaniards' worst loss percentage against any manager he's faced at least five times. So in some ways, even though I thought Manchester City were excellent against Chelsea this past weekend, sh showing form that I was like, wow, we haven't seen that in some time, maybe even the record-setting season, where they just look tremendous in every facet of the game. I kind of like United in this one, and I know they've been struggling at home, but that was earlier in the season. They've won four out of their last five at Old Trafford. I think they're looking pretty good right now. For me, they have been slapped last year in 2020. They've been slapped in the semifinals three times. And I feel like if they really want to break through and be a team of consequence and actually win something, you have to go through some dark times to get to the, the bright lights, right? Uh, it's always darkest before it's dawn, I think the saying goes. And I like United uh, to do the business here. I really do. I think they're going to win 2-1. And if you like United to win over two and a half goals, it's plus 400. United to win both teams to score plus 450. United to win straight up is plus uh, 260, like I said. I think those are all tremendous value. And I think United's going to do the business. And I'm done. Thank you for my, very much. Beautiful. Great lines there. <laughs> Jimmy, thank you so much. Uh, JJ, we know it's the Carabao Cup, but listen, like two things. One, when the game's actually happening and you have a Manchester Derby, it's going to be hopefully entertaining. And the other thing I feel, JJ, is that, you know, United have been living in the shadow of Manchester City for the biggest part of oh, mo more than a decade now, right? In terms of the trophies, the leagues, etc. I feel that this is just another step of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer saying we're still heading in the right direction, uh, albeit being the Carabao Cup. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, it's, I mean, you know, you know my thoughts uh, well on on how I feel about silverware and how clubs should view uh, potential trophies to be won at the beginning of every season. Uh, but yeah, when you have clubs who are sort of nonplussed about their participation in a competition, it's this kind of match when it pits you against one of your fierce rivals uh, that really makes you sit up and, and and take it seriously. Obviously, there's a place in a final at stake. 
but also, uh, you, like you said, neither neither side is going to want to lose to uh, their you know to their local rivals. Uh, you know, there's bragging rights at stake, uh, and it's like you said for for United, it's an opportunity to finally break through. You know, to 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 have that moment where they finally reach the final uh, and potentially have the opportunity to come out of City's shadow a little bit in as much as, you know, City have been the, the, the side winning the majority of the silverware in Manchester over the last few years. Uh, I think there's quite a few probably irate United listeners who would say that United have always maintained their, uh, uh, that their image, the greater image, the more powerful club uh, over City throughout that time. But it is it's two, two of the, the biggest Premier League sides going at it uh, for a place in the final. So on paper, you know, it's a very uh, it's a very mouthwatering prospect. You'd hope that it's the same City side that we saw uh, dismantling Chelsea a couple of days ago. Uh, and for sure, I'm, I agree with Jimmy that we don't want to see a repeat of that awful, dry, goalless uh, affair that we saw a couple of weeks ago uh, between United and City. So great opportunity, no matter uh, whether it's in the Carabao Cup or not, but, you know, for some great football for us to watch, uh, you know, but also for, for one of these sides to, uh, you know, get one over on their neighbours uh, and, and have that possibility of winning silverware uh, at the end of it. Yeah, from a squad perspective, uh, Manchester United is pretty healthy, uh, aside from Edison Cavani, who is healthy, but still suspended. And uh, they actually have the advantage as well of, of having a longer break uh, since they played last time they played was Friday. So uh, last week. So they're still a big time. Whereas Man City, to your point about Chelsea, uh, you know, they played on Sunday. So, you know, less time to prepare, but they do have a deep squad. Uh, Jimmy, uh, in terms of players, anybody in particular that you're interested in? In thinking here because I feel like cup situations are a great opportunity to both your points for uh, not, you know, not your Bruno Fernandes as we know that what he can do, but players that maybe are on the fringe that can maybe show uh, what they can do for their respective squads. Yeah, I'm going to say Phil Foden, actually the one that stands out for me. He's finally getting vocal that he's not playing enough for the longest time. He's been very quiet and I think somewhat meek about his playing time, even though he might have deserved it. Now he's finally putting his flag on the ground going and say, hey, I need to play more. I, I'm a good player. I can fit into this team. And, and he showed it against Chelsea in particular. And when he plays in the cup competitions, I have a stat here that uh, he's had a direct hand in nine goals from his last 12 league cup appearances. And I think he just, this is usually where he gets his opportunities, right? He's usually not playing in the league. So he steps up and proves himself in the league cups. And I think Foden to score any times plus 180, he just scored against Chelsea. So his confidence could be pretty high at the moment. And for him to get an assist is actually plus 500 on William Hill. I like that value a lot, but there's some other assist things you should look at. Kevin De Bruyne to get an assist plus 180. Bruno Fernandez to get an assist plus 200. I think all three of those guys that I mentioned will have some involvement. They're around the ball a lot. They pull the strings for their respective teams. So it's just a matter of how you're feeling, what your heart's telling you to go with. But you should always use your brain when you're betting because the heart always seems – it gets too emotional with your bets if you, if you use, use your heart. The latest also on Ederson as well, who remains self-isolating due to COVID and Zach Steffen playing against Chelsea might be another opportunity as well for the American to be between the sticks. JJ, any player in particular uh, from either side that, that you're looking forward to seeing or maybe that can uh, possibly inspire uh, a win uh, against a rival? I mean, I think you, you've you mentioned the two. I think uh, the, the word that Jimmy was looking for with Foden was he was being very British, where he's uh, <laughs> not going to be very confrontational, uh, you know, very polite, almost too polite at times. Uh, I agree with you completely. Foden is a guy who, w whenever I watch him, he's definitely one of uh, England's brighter talents, uh, you know, up there sort of along with uh, along with Jack Grealish as one of the guys who I think could be the future of that national team. Uh, there's just always that question that lingers and it happens as well a lot with, uh, you know, at clubs like Paris Saint-Germain, where you've got the homegrown guys who come through and they obviously have talent, but it's a question of when they will get given uh, that opportunity. And the League Cup has always been been one of those competitions where a lot of younger players from the clubs, particularly Arsenal over the years, uh, you know, it was kind of like a breeding ground for, for them to start being bled into the team. Uh, and I think that to be, to be fair, I do expect to see, to, to see Foden in this match and, and for him to feature quite heavily, but he needs more competitive games now, not just the, the Carabao Cup. Uh, and I think it's a good opportunity for, for Zach Stefan as well to, you know, potentially string some consecutive appearances together. You know, it's, uh, he's, he's been quite lucky with this opportunity that, that's been presented to him. Uh, and you'd assume that, that Guardiola will present him with that opportunity to start again. Uh, you know, and that'll do wonders for his confidence uh, and him potentially sort of installing himself uh, in the long term with City. 
What's your prediction, JJ? Ooh, I can see a few goals in this one, uh, but I'm going to say that United get it done very narrowly. Uh, I'm going to say 2-1. 2-1 to United. Uh, how about you, Jimmy? Yeah, I'm the same. I'm United 2-1, to one. even though City has the best defense in the Premier League. We didn't talk about that so much. But because of that, I feel like they've sacrificed some of the goals going forward. They're 10th in the league in scoring. I know this is the Carabao Cup, and it's a little bit different than, than uh, a league competition per se. But I think those things are relevant. And I think it will be tight. I say 2-1 as well to United. I also give it to United, but I feel like it will be a goal fest. I don't know why. I'm just going to go with a 3-2 win to Manchester United. Let's see what happens. No, we just completely yeah. jinxed them, by the way. So Yeah, it's going to be nail-nail. <laughs> go bet Somebody on will... City. <laughs> nail-nail, nail, three goal, sendings off. Picking United by a goal, though. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So that means Man City will win. All right. When <laughs> we come back, we will uh, talk about the rest of Europe, including... PSG as they return to action with a brand new shiny manager. Stay right here. Welcome back, everybody, to Que Golasso. Jimmy Conrad, Jonathan Johnson. We're talking Europe. We're talking some matches on Wednesday. We've done the Carabao Cup. Now we talk about PSG as Mauricio Pochettino prepares for his tenure with the French giant. We have Jonathan Johnson right there from Paris, right there. He was there in the presser, um, albeit digitally, but uh, listen to everything that Pochettino had to say as PSG prepare to face Saint-Étienne and really just their new journey with uh, with the Argentinian manager. So JJ, what, what were some of the biggest highlights from this presser and how do you expect PSG uh, to face Saint Etienne under Pochettino? Well, considering that it lasted over an hour, I think most of us were quite grateful when it came to a close. <laughs> um, but I think it was it, it, it was very interesting. Um, first of all, it was interesting that uh, you know uh, Pochettino had to fend off so many questions about the transfer window. You know, the guy's been in the in the role for three days, less than three days, uh, you, you know, and is already facing tons of questions about Lionel Messi, Christian Eriksen, Deli Alli. Uh, but he was very obviously uh, motivated and excited when he was talking about the possibilities of what he can do with this PSG squad. You know, he went into a bit of depth uh, on what he hopes to do with the likes of Neymar, uh, Kylian Mbappe, uh, Marco Verratti as well at one point. So it was a very interesting uh, press conference from a, a tactical point of view. And whenever he got the opportunity to delve into what he's actually, you know, hoping to, to implement on the pitch. So, you know, there's a lot to look forward to coming into this match against Saint-Étienne Pochettino, uh, was, was was giving credit to Claude Puel earlier, uh, a coach he knows well from his time in the Premier League, who he's going to come up against, who's in charge of uh, Saint-Étienne on Wednesday. Uh, and also Pochettino, I think, was was surprised a little bit by the the length uh, of the uh, the injury list that, that has confronted him since taking over as PSG coach as well. There's a lot of players who are going to be missing for the, the game against Saint-Étienne. No Mauro Icardi, uh, no Neymar. Uh, no Presnel Kimpembe, just a few of the, the names who will be absent. Uh, Rafinha as well tested positive for COVID-19, so he won't be there either. So this is an opportunity for some of PSG's more peripheral figures uh, who are not fit, uh, you know, to, to uh, sorry, who are fit to, to stake their claim. Uh, and, and potentially impress Pochettino and win some points early on because there are quite a few of those guys sort of kicking around the squad and you know some of those absences will create uh, an opportunity for some of these guys to, to, to perhaps show that they're worthy of some sort of consideration moving forward. Jimmy, how do you think uh, Pochettino is going to do here? Not, not, not tomorrow, obviously it's just one game, but as he begins life, you know, one of the most interesting things about Pochettino, because he lives under that Bielsa umbrella, it's kind of the beginning of his campaigns with teams, because that's really where you see how they are on the pitch, right? High press, physical, never say die kind of attitude. And it's kind of like a step-by-step -step process. I'm very interested to see how they do at the very beginning, especially as JJ said, no Neymar, et cetera. How do you think they're going to do? Well, I'm going to say that every team usually has that new manager bounce. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit with Athletic Bilbao. We talk about them in Barcelona. That's the other big game on Wednesday because they have a new manager as well, Athletic. I'm curious to see because it seems like from my opinion or my, my standpoint, my perspective, that they kind of reached their ceiling with Tuchel and they needed a bit of a reshuffle. They needed a new voice. And we talk about that a lot with national teams, but we don't always talk about that at the club level. And, and 
And, and so I'm excited to see. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing whispers that he might be putting Marco Verratti at, at the number 10 spot. I want to see what that's all about and get him a little bit higher up the field and see how he can unlock things. You know, and, and the funny thing that I see is the PSG lost the Champions League final last year. The year before that, Mauricio Pochettino lost it with Spurs. They're like a, they're like a match made in heaven here is to see if they can actually combine forces and win the Champions League, which I think is going to be a big point of emphasis. They've already proven they can pretty much have anybody at manager and win Liga with all due respect to all the other teams, including uh, Leo. And uh, I don't, didn't think I said that right. And Lille, who are currently... You did! <laughs> right, uh, who are currently... Um, <laughs> I'm proud of myself right now. Uh, uh, you know, on top of those uh, of PSG at the moment, I know Monaco won the league with Kylian Mbappe a couple seasons ago, but 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 Champions League I think is ultimately the the end game for these guys, and uh, I'm curious to see. But ultimately the reshuffle, how these players respond to to him in particular. He has history with the club, being a former captain. He can speak French as well. You know, I mean, I think he can really relate to the press and the media, JJ, and speak to them, in, you know, in natural tongue. And but then also, you know, be able to relate to his players and maybe in a different way than Tuchel could. So, so I'm excited on a lot of levels to see what what Pochettino can do with these this group of guys, especially if they do sign players maybe not in January, but over the summer to help strengthen uh, the squad in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I'm, was glad meant- that you men- I'm glad that you mentioned the Verratti thing uh, because that's it's something that was spotted in the training sessions uh, and then he was asked about it uh, and he's kind of surprised, I think, about how much the press has already been talking, speculating as to what he might do with the, with, with the, with the formation, how he might tweak it. So we'll, we'll see how Verratti works out. I mean, obviously... Uh, there is one deficiency in Verratti's game if you place him that far forward, and I that's agree. that you don't see Verratti shooting very often. Mm. Uh, when he does, he, he he does generally tend to find the target, but it's not known as one of his strong suits. So I'm very curious to see how that works out. But one other thing that Pochettino said about uh, you know getting to know these players is that some of them might start in one position and finish in another. So he's looking to find the best positions to get the best out of the likes of Neymar, the likes of Mbappe, the likes of Verratti as well, obviously of course uh, so you know he he is planning to do a bit of experimentation which is going to be fine considering the matches they've got coming up uh, in this next week you know you've got Saint-Étienne here on Wednesday then you've got uh, Brest coming to Parc des Princes at the weekend and curiously as well Pochettino is going to immediately have the opportunity to finally end his silverware drought and put something in the cabinet because there's the Trophée de Champion next week against Marseille and Lens. So that gives him the immediate opportunity to get that monkey off of his back and potentially, you know, work up to the task of, of taking on Barcelona in the Champions League, however much of a task that is at this moment in time. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, but with, with that a clear conscience, you know, perhaps feeling a, a bit of extra motivation considering that he's, you know, he's finally got you know something shiny to to be able to look at when he goes home uh, with the hope of of adding much more to it uh adding to that point about the emphasis on the champions league that was one of the things that that pochettino went into great depth in during this uh unveiling he was asked about the importance of the champions league uh, and he you know he held no uh, no punches he he admitted that you know it is a focus of of, of psg I mean, for any big club uh, at this level uh, and that it's something that they hope to to win and win with style uh, at some point in the future and he hopes that he can you know add something that that leads them to that goal but also uh you know not letting up domestically and continuing to win everything uh, that they can so you could definitely take from the f- from this press conference that he intends to continue that domestic dominance but wanting to add a bit of continental success to it as well uh, and one last thing i would say there was an interesting interview with uh, Thomas Tuchel's assistant coach, Zod Love, uh, over the weekend. And he said at one point that it basically became inevitable that PSG and Tuchel would part company. Uh, he said that he felt like it wasn't something that could, could work long term. So I think you also have to factor in that everyone in and around the squad at PSG has probably felt this way. Uh, you know, since the since the Champions League run to the final and the defeat to Bayern. And it just begs the question why PSG didn't move to, you know, to perhaps make this change uh, a, a bit earlier. You know, they've done it now uh, and Pochettino seems to be the right man uh, for the right job at the right time. We'll have to wait and see if that's how it actually turns out. But it, it does seem like the position uh, of Thomas Tuchel had become untenable uh, in Paris. And that's why we saw PSG pull the trigger. Wait, I, I, somebody I, was, I, hold up a second. Somebody, honestly, I'm, I'm so angry about that. Because like the thing is, like we've been saying that for so long. I'm sorry, but it's like Tuchel was never the man for PSG. It just wasn't going <laughs> to fit. 
I'm talking to my grandmother in Peru. She's telling me that. Right. It's, it, <laughs> it's just so obvious. And it's so frustrating sometimes when like, you know, Leonardo and others or whatever, you know, the board just sees, you know, a certain style and they think, oh, yeah, no, this is the man for us. Pochettino was so going to fit. Maybe there was a contractual situation with Tottenham not allowing him to like really have a conversation with PSG. But it was it was so obvious. So whatever uh, Tuchel's manager said in that interview is 100 percent correct. And, and Tuchel himself should have probably seen that coming anyway as well. Right, Jimmy? I was just going to say, I mean, I we all knew it right after he signed as manager of PSG. Like, well, this isn't yeah. going to last very long. He just doesn't fit. I don't feel like he ever fit. There were certain parts of his, his uh, you know, philosophy and, and methodology that I think maybe could move the needle a little bit. But he wasn't that exciting hire that was going to, you know, light a flame under all these superstars that he has and really inspire those guys. And we've talked about it before, but Tuchel doesn't really just embody that type of confidence I guess that, that kind of swagger that I think this team needs and I think Pochettino though he maybe isn't the same way as a former defender like myself and there are some conservative ways that you want to maybe approach things but but I still feel like he's going to give them the confidence to be themselves and maybe a way that Tuchel wasn't yeah that's it all right final question just very very quick Dele Alli or Christian Eriksen either one would fit in PSG do you think I know that uh Pochettino had to answer a few questions uh, JJ let's go with you Dele Alli or Christian Eriksen former players with Pochettino would they fit I think that Christian Eriksen would be a better fit at this moment in time, uh, considering the feasi feasibility of the transfer. <clears throat> Ultimately, in terms of a playing style, Deli Ali is probably uh, the, the the one who would fit better into that squad. But it, it's going to be uh, a question of how feasible the transfer is, and considering the the financial restraints, uh, you know, I think that Eriksen is probably more of a goer right now because of Inter's interest in Leandro Paredes. It's just a question of whether Pochettino feels that Paredes is an absolutely vital cog in this squad that he needs to keep a hold of. But I can't see PSG being in a position where they'll be able to add Ali uh, this window. Jimmy? Yeah, I go with Christian Eriksen. I think that when you bring him in, because he's been humbled, I think, going to Inter Milan, he thought he was going to go there and be the stud, and it didn't work out for him. You say, hey, listen, I'm going to bring you in. We already have a pre-existing relationship. I know... You know, you, we both know what to expect out of each other. But in this team, all I need you to do, you're an excellent passer of the ball, is I need you to unlock. We don't really have a number 10. We're trying Marco Verratti there. Uh, you know, we're forcing him into that spot. And to JJ's point, he's probably not as good higher up the field. Erickson can score from distance. But really, just feed the ball to Mbappe and Neymar. Get those guys the ball in good spots. Let them be who they're going to be. Join the Maybe join the attack late. Crash the box late. And you'll get a couple goals yourself. I think you're going to get more maybe Christian Eriksen to understand that role as opposed to Deli Ali, who just seems, I don't know, Deli Ali sometimes. I, I, he's a tremendous talent, but he's so up and down. I just don't know if PSG needs that type of inconsistency in their squad. Maybe, maybe he'd get a breath of fresh air by joining a new team with a former manager, but, but I like Christian Eriksen. I think he'd be a better fit for what they need. Just Much one thing that I'd like to yeah. add on, on that is when players generally tend to go to PSG sort of with their tail between their legs, having, in Jimmy's words, having been humbled, they generally tend to find uh, a, a second win. I mean, look at what PSG did for Angel Di Maria's career. Uh, look at what they've done with Moise Ken as well so far this season. It's, you know, PSG has a reinvigorating impact on some guys who have made a move somewhere and then have, have quickly felt disillusioned. So, you know, I, I think for that reason, uh, I agree with Jimmy that I think Ericsson perhaps makes the most sense at this moment in time. Yeah, and it's also the philosophy of the respective manager, right? I mean, you know, Pochettino has a different system to what others may be used to. And also the, the, the answer in this probably fits uh, in what Pochettino will do with Verratti if he's pushing him up and relying on other people to protect. We will see. All right, that was PSG Talk. When we come back, our final part where we'll talk about AC Milan, uh, Scudetto hunting league leader AC Milan against Juventus. Ooh, tasty matchup. And as Jimmy said, Athletic Bilbao against Barcelona. Stay right here. Welcome back, everybody, to Que Golasso, Jimmy Conrad, Jonathan Johnson, uh, finishing our Wednesday preview episode. And we stay in Europe. Uh, a really great game in Italy, Jimmy Conrad, as AC Milan host Juventus. Really good one here. Yeah, absolutely. And they're meeting on Epiphany, which apparently I learned this. Fun fact, everybody. I'm a Wikipedia warrior, but uh, it's, a, it's a day of revelation and celebration. And I really feel, I really feel like 
this is going to be a game that reveals whether AC Milan can be champions and, and actually win the Scudetto this season. Well this done, Jimmy. One. I Thank like you very that much. connection. <laughs> Thank well you very done. much. And, and I, you know, Juve, they have six draws so far. You know, they haven't really maybe found their best 11. Cristiano Ronaldo has scored over half their goals. You can, you can feel that there's maybe an over-reliance on CR7, which is not a surprise. Usually any team that he goes to, there's, there's a big reliance on what he brings to the table. And he scored two goals on the weekend against Udinese. So he's in good form. And I think that's going to be something for, for Milan to, to keep in perspective. What I find crazy, this is the craziest stat that I saw about this particular game. And, and I've seen it before, but I just need to remind everybody. In Milan's past 35 league games, they have scored two goals in all 35 of those. Whether they win, lose, or draw, it doesn't matter. They've scored two goals in their last 35 league goals. That, that's just wild to me. I think Juve is going to probably put a big emphasis on, on stifling that attack, even though Zlatan isn't going to play. Rafael Liao scored in this fixture last year when Milan won 4-2 to against Juve. Uh, I, he scored again this weekend, a tremendous goal where he chipped the goalkeeper uh, to keep Milan uh, on top when they were down to 10 men. I really like Rafael Leal a lot. I think he could hit the back of the net. I actually like him to score any time uh, in this one, and I'll find that value for you guys. Oh, plus 200. I, I don't know. I, I really feel 1-1 here, and I, I know that goes against that crazy stat I threw at you guys, but I just feel like both teams are going to be kind of conservative. I feel like a draw wouldn't hurt anybody, obviously wouldn't benefit anybody, but I think against – each other like all right we'll take a draw plus 215 for Milan to win straight up plus 225 for the draw uh, plus 135 for Juve to win a lot of value here so wherever you're going with if you, you're going to double down on something I would consider that here's a fun fact for you though with Sandra Tonali getting a red card in the last game it looks like uh, Rade Krunic is going to start he's only had two starts this season and he had two yellow cards in those games uh, if he gets a yellow in this one, it's plus 180 because he's getting the start. I think he's going to get another one. I think he's due. And that's what he uh, is. is he's, he's very aggressive in midfield. If you guys are a straight up Cristiano Ronaldo fan, just to throw that out there, if you like him to score, Juve to win and both teams to score plus 480. I think that's pretty good value. Yeah, that's very good. Sandro Tonali, by the way, who's just a doppelganger of Adam Driver. If you don't believe me, just what, like they look exactly the same. Um, look, I think a draw benefits Milan, actually, JJ. You know, they're, they're top of the table. There's still quite a gap, 10 points uh, between Milan and Juventus. Uh, Jimmy gave us some good lines here, just some uh, squad updates as well. Dybala apparently has a fever. Uh, we don't know if that's COVID related, so I'm not sure if he's playing. Morata will I not mean, be. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean Dybala's had. COVID like what 20 times <laughs> since this thing came along so that's why Perla just said a fever there's, there's no other things Morata is injured and he will not take part in this one he's hoping Rabio and Cuadrado will return uh, but Ibrahimovic obviously the big loss for Milan and Ronaldo as long as he's fit anything can happen with Juve how do you see this game JJ yeah, well, I don't think that Juve want to draw at all because one of the things that I've been struck most by kind of keeping an eye on their situation over the last couple of weeks is not only is this their worst start to a season since like the, the mid 80s, Juve, have, they, they rarely lose, but they've drawn six times already this season. And that's mm. you know 12 points that have been dropped. That is where Juventus are losing uh, the the title at this moment in time. They need they needed to have turned some of those draws into wins. So I think that this is an absolute must win for them, especially uh, with no Zlatan. Uh, I think the thing that makes uh, a Zlatan this Milan more threatening to Juve is that Milan are a, are a younger, more vibrant side in certain positions. Juve are creaking. They're showing their age all across the pitch uh, at this moment in time. I mean, just watching the match against Udinese the other day, I mean, okay, you know, they, they ran out quite comfortable winners at the end of the day if you look at the score. But if you look at the way that the match unfolded, uh, Udinese had an early goal shorted off because of VAR. Uh, they hit the woodwork twice during the match as well. It could very easily have been a completely different story. We saw them ripped apart at home by Fiorentina as well, a team that you wouldn't have expected to go to Turin based on their form uh, and perform well. So this is a, a big, big game uh, for Juve and for Pirlo because... I don't feel that this audition for him to keep the keep the coaching role on a permanent basis after this season or a long term basis uh, is going particularly well at this moment in time. Yes, of course, you know there there are issues with with the squad, but for me, it feels like it always kind of felt like he was kind of a holding 
uh, coach, you know, somebody to keep in place for a season while Juve worked on the guy that they potentially hope will, will lead them for the, for the future. Uh, and I think that they're now in a position where they absolutely cannot afford to, to draw any more matches, dropping further points uh, and coming into a game like this, especially when you consider that they've also got into just around the corner as well, which is another top of the table clash. You know, they absolutely need to win both of these games because even winning those matches and their game in hand against Napoli doesn't guarantee them getting back into top spot. Yeah, and the biggest issue here is that it's not just any manager. It's a legend, uh, a club legend in Pirlo. So it's kind of like the Lampard-Chelsea situation. You know, uh, how do you handle a problem like uh, a former club legend? All right, so... Uh, Jimmy, you have a draw. You're staying with that draw. Um, you may be swayed. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I do agree about the youth situation. I mean, obviously, you know, Weston McKenney, Chiesa, et cetera, you know, the lift at the back. But, you know, there are still also issues with Chiellini and Bonucci as well that can be exposed to pace, which is exactly what AC Milan have. Yeah, I, I do think that Rafael Liao is going to have some opportunities in this game. He is a 21-year-old. 21 year old up top. I think he's learned a lot from Zlatan. I think the whole team has a lot of the younger players are kind of learning how to be a good professional, but also be confident, especially in tough moments. Obviously him being out and some other players being out, they've, they've still stepped up and, and remained on top of the table. And I think that is a testament to what Stefano Pioli, the manager from Milan has done and instilled in this group, despite going through some tough times, especially him in particular, who was on the chopping block for, for many months, but still figured out a way now to get them where they are. I like both teams to score and the draw plus 265. I like that one a lot. If you guys are thinking one, one, and it's under two and a half goals, it's plus 310. But if you say it's a draw and it's the over plus 800, so two, two, I don't really feel like two, two is too far fetched uh, between these two sides. I, I, I know you can make a pretty strong narrative for, for Juve having the must win, and I get where JJ's coming from. And I think Milan have, to your point, Luis, have more than enough you know, talent to, to get the win as well, which means it's going to settle on a draw. I feel like that's just what happens in Serie A. So, so that's kind of where I'm leaning at the moment. And those are the, I, there's some good value there. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't mind throwing 10 bucks at the, the plus 800 at the 2-2, to be honest. Yeah, what do you say, JJ? What's your what's your score prediction? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna put a cat amongst the pigeons. I think that it's gonna be tight for a period, and then I think uh, something's gonna happen, and Milan are gonna pull away. I can I agree with Jimmy. I I can see a four goal encounter, but I'm gonna say a three one win for Milan. Wow, um, oh, I'm going for a stalemate. Nail nail. I just oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I'm being so okay. boring today. Catinaccio is dead. It's been it gone is. for years. It is. <laughs> oh my god! No, I just, I just listen. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, to be fair though, the last draw between both these sides was back in 2012. So historically, it's not like a draw is something they'll say. But I don't know. I just think. Uh, it, I hope it's not. I don't want it to be. So maybe I'm doing a counter argument here. All right, let's move to La Liga. As Jimmy was mentioning, uh, Athletic Bilbao have a new manager. Uh, former Valencia man uh, Marcelino takes over. Uh, now they're hosting Barcelona uh, on Wednesday. Jimmy, what do you have here? Well, I'll just start with the line. Athletic uh, plus three, 333 to win at home. Obviously, they've made their their San Mamis, their stadium, uh, a fortress in a lot of different ways. Uh, plus 275 for the draw, minus 125 for Barcelona to win. For everybody that's unfamiliar with these lines, you have to bet 125 to win 100. Uh, you have to bet 100 to win 333 uh, and so on and so forth. I really like this, this change at manager uh, Garantano. Unfortunately, they've only won two out of the last eight athletic. I like Marcelino a lot. I thought he did very well with Valencia. He had a falling out with the board over who was going to be captain. He wanted a longtime player to be there and to remain captain. And, and apparently the higher ups did not. And that was the start of a lot of issues, I think, or maybe just uh, uh, revealed a lot more issues than maybe there was initially. So he got fired, but he led them to the Copa del Rey in 2019. They beat Barcelona in the final. Kevin Gamero, who I'm a big fan of, uh, he, and I don't say his name right, Kevin Gamero, Gamero? <laughs> whatever. I'm trying my best. That was Gamero. my New Year's resolution, everybody. But well, he he's scored French, in that right? Game. So Gamero. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm doing my best. But yeah, so he did well with Valencia. I'm glad to see him resurface a little while later with a, with a good club with Athletic. Uh, with Barcelona's perspective, I, well, actually to bring back a, a theme I said earlier, I think that Athletic are going to have that new manager bounce where everybody's going to try to impress. You know, if you haven't been playing well under a certain manager, now everybody has a chance to kind of redeem themselves and, and get back on the, on the front foot and have a, a good fresh start. So I think you're going to see that from Athletic. Uh, some fun facts about this one. Uh, Barcelona could only muster one goal against bottom of the table, Huesca, on the weekend. They only scored one goal against Abar uh, the week before that. 
And you add to the fact that there have been two under two and a half goals scored in 16 F athletics last 20 home games and athletic have seen two and a half under two and a half goals in the last seven matches against Barcelona in all competitions. I think this one's going to be tight. I'm going to draw again. I got one, one. It's the favorite score line on William Hill plus five fifty for that. Um, but I don't know if Messi's going to score. I kind of like Ushman Dembele to score anytime plus 190 and Yaki Williams to score for Athletic uh, anytime plus 260. By the way, just an update from Barcelona perspective, two members of their staff uh, tested positive for COVID, so they had to postpone their early Tuesday training session. They're waiting for results. So the presser from Kuman was um, uh, canceled. So, you know, as we're taping, uh, the hope is that Barcelona train later in the day, but you know, that might, you know, ruin some, uh, you know, tactical opportunities for Barcelona. JJ, uh, Barcelona, you know, they got their win last time around. Um, what do you see here against Athletic Bilbao? Uh, as Jimmy said, you know, at home, Bilbao does pretty well. And it's not like Barcelona is doing amazing things as of late. How do you see this game? Yeah, absolutely. And then obviously with the injury news about Felipe Coutinho as well, you know, he's now out for a couple of months. Not that Barcelona used Coutinho particularly well, in my opinion, but he's just another uh, very talented player who they won't be able to call on for some important fixtures in the future. I mean, if there's a big team in La Liga that you want to come up against right now, if, you, if you're one of the teams in the Spanish top flight, you want it to be Barcelona. You know, you look at the way that they're performing all the time. They're short of so much confidence. Uh, you know, they're Kuman has yet to really establish exactly what he wants from them tactically because he's unable to either, uh, you know, with the, the situation that's going on surrounding the club, uh, players being unavailable on the pitch, uh, you know, and then star players, you know, not, not performing at the same level as they've done in the past. You know, for me, I actually fancy Athletic Club to, to, to get the win here. I mean, I, it wouldn't surprise me the draw, but I actually think that the Athletic Club you know, could could sneak a win by a goal because I think that they will be feeling upbeat. Uh, you know, I think Marcelino is the right man at the right club in the right time. Uh, you know, I think that his approach is, is really going to do wonders with a squad that's I've always had a soft spot for in La Liga. You know, I think everyone has to respect their Basconi policy that they absolutely insist on uh, on not moving away from. Uh, you know, and the fact that they've managed to stay in the, the Spanish top flight for, for so long, just, you know, just doing that. It, it's something that I, I think really adds to the identity of, uh, of, of the Spanish top flight. Uh, and I, I really hope that this is going to be a, a move that works out for the club because, like you said, Marcelino deserved more credit than he got. For, for how he did with, uh, with with Valencia. And I think that there are still some very talented players in this uh, athletic club squad. Uh, it's just that they needed a new coach to come in to sort of you know show exactly what they can do. Uh, and this is the, the perfect opportunity. No lack of motivation coming into a clash against a vulnerable Barcelona side, uh, you know, playing at home as well, where they, where they feel most comfortable. I, I, I definitely can see them getting the result. Yeah, and listen, I want—I don't want Barcelona fans to to get angry at us. Okay, okay, you're in a six-match unbeaten run. That's fine, but it hasn't been impressive. Is the point? And you're still fifth. However, the win, obviously, uh, you know, with other results going your way, takes you to third. Uh, but to both uh, Jimmy and JJ's points, this Athletic Bilbao could fancy their chances here. New manager Marcelino uh, is a very good coach. They're at home. You know, so it's not it's not crazy to suggest that, you know, Barcelona's uh, six match on being run could could come to an end here. All right. Give me your predictions here, uh, Jimmy. What, what do you have here to finalize it? I think you said already, but what, tell me. Again. Yeah, I'm probably going to go with the, the draw. Both teams to score plus three thirty, I think, seems like the safe bet. I think Messi could have an assist plus two hundred. You know, I think he could set up somebody and make that happen. Um, obviously, he's in and around the ball a ton. My only concern for Athletic is that they're going to switch formations from the four, two, three, one, which they've been playing all season to Marcelino's favored 442. And if he makes that type of adjustment right away, I, I worry that the team might might not be in this the, the, the spots they feel comfortable in. So so that would be my only hesitation per se. I know PSG and Pochettino is going to run into that as well. But you'd like to think that you have talented players with high IQs for the game. They should be able to adapt. I, I think just given historically this game's always pretty tight, uh, I'll still stick with the one one. How about you, JJ? I'm gonna go two one to athletic. Yep, and listen, I'm Peruvian, but if you go way, way, way back, Eche Garay is from San Sebastián in Bilbao. So I'm going to go with Athletic Bilbao and a very tight, tight one nothing win. Wow. And uh, Barcelona's uh, un 
beaten run will come to an end. And obviously I will be wrong and you can all laugh about it <laughs> later in the week. All right. That's all the time we have for Jonathan Johnson. Thank you so much, buddy. Thanks a lot for having me on guys. An absolute pleasure. What better way to kick off 2021 than with you guys? Oh man, listen to you. I don't pay your wages, by the way. So you don't have to pay that. Okay. Oh, I'm, no? feeling all, I'm feeling all warm and fuzzy right now. Thanks. JJ. <laughs> Jimmy. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Luis. JJ, always a pleasure. I want to thank Jimmy Conrad and Jonathan Johnson for joining me today. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Kegolasso Pod. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your pods. Please leave a rating and review. It is the absolute best way to grow this show. Thank you so much for your support. Have a great rest of your week.